Let's talk a little bit more about water because water is so vitally important for life. We can't survive without water. We've already taken a look at the structure of water, so we know that a single water molecule is composed of one oxygen with covalent bonds to two hydrogens, and that these covalent bonds are polar covalent bonds, which is what allows water molecules to form hydrogen bonds with each other. And water molecules can form huge networks of hydrogen bonds between all of the molecules. And these hydrogen bonds are moving. They break and the water molecule moves a little further away and it comes back and another one forms. So we have this constant changing um, number of hydrogen bonds if we're looking at liquid water as the water molecules are moving around each other and they form bonds and they let go. It's these hydrogen bonds that are responsible for some of the very important properties of water that make it so useful to the creation and maintenance of life. First of all, the ability to form hydrogen bonds means that molecules of water are attracted to other molecules. This gives water what's called its cohesion. When you put a drop of water on a tabletop, it doesn't spread out, but it stays together in a drop. And we can see drops of water on leaves and all over the place because water molecules are attracted to each other. When the water molecules are more attracted to each other than the substances around them, the water stays together and in a drop instead of spreading out. This is water's cohesion and it really gives water a lot of structure and allows water to have surface tension so that other things can be on top of water without falling in and also so things can remain suspended in water like blood cells remaining suspended in blood because of the structure of cohesion of water where water molecules are attracted to each other. The ability of water to form hydrogen bonds also allows water molecules to be attracted to other types of molecules. And this is what allows water to get things wet. Water molecules are attracted to the fibers in a paper towel, and that's how a paper towel gets wet from a drop of water. So when we talked before about the drop of water going in a tabletop, it was gonna stay in a drop and not spread out. But if you put a drop of water on a paper towel, the water is attracted to the fibers in the paper towel, and the water molecules spread out as they're attracted there, and that's how the water will spread um, through something that's absorbent, like a paper towel. This is also why you see if you put water into a graduated cylinder, it forms a meniscus where the water sort of clings to the sides of the tube. And this is what allows water even to climb up very narrow spaces, even against the force of gravity. So if you put a very small narrow glass tube into water, water will actually climb up the inside of that glass tube by the process of capillary action, where the water is being attracted to the tube and climbing up. This is really important for allowing water to move through tight spaces and allowing water from the roots of plants to move up into the leaves of the plant. This property of water being attracted to other things is called adhesion because water will adhere to other substances like the fibers in the paper towel or the glass of a narrow tube. A second important property of water is that water resists temperature changes. It's actually pretty difficult to change the temperature of water. It takes a lot of energy to be able to do that. The amount of energy it takes to change the temperature of a substance is called its specific heat. And water has a high specific heat. That means it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. This is easy to see living here in Michigan, where we're surrounded by water. Imagine, if you would, a nice hot day in June. You go to the beach and you walk barefoot out onto the sand and the sun's been on the sand for hours. And how does the sand feel? Very, very hot. Sand has a low specific heat, so it changes temperature quickly. So you run, skip, jump across the hot sand, and you plunge into Lake Huron. And how does that water feel? The water is cold. In June, the water in Lake Huron is still quite chilly. Even though the sun has been beating down on it the same as on the sand, even though a lot of energy has been put into that water, it's still cold because it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. This is really important biologically because it means that the water in our bodies can help maintain a stable temperature. Because it takes so much heat to change the temperature of water, having water in our bodies helps keep our temperatures stable. This is important because of all the different reactions going on in our bodies that either release heat 
or use heat, our bodies would fluctuate in temperature a lot more if we didn't have water to help use or absorb some of that energy without changing temperature. Related to this is the heat of vaporization. The heat of vaporization is the amount of energy it takes to turn a substance from a liquid into a gas, so to make it evaporate. Water has a really high heat of vaporization. That means that as, in order for water to evaporate, it takes a lot of energy. This is important biologically because it is the reason water can cool the body so effectively. If you have water on your skin, the water on your skin uses the heat from your body to evaporate and that's taking the heat out of the body and cooling it. That's why we sweat when we get hot. The water will then evaporate from our skin and that cools down the body. The third important property of water is that water is an excellent solvent. What that means is that lots of things dissolve in water. When something dissolves in a liquid, that liquid is called a solvent. The substance that dissolves into the solvent is called the solute. So lots of different solutes will go into water and then dissolve in water. Since there's so much water in our bodies and in our cells, it's important that things can dissolve into that water in order to function so that the molecules can get together and, and react with each other so that things can travel through the water. The way water dissolves substances is by surrounding them. So let's go back to the idea of salt, sodium chloride. Salt is formed by the ionic attraction between the positively charged sodiums and the negatively charged chlorides. The negative oxygen end of a water molecule is attracted to the positive sodium ions and water molecules will actually surround each individual sodium ion that way so that they can't interact with the chlorides. The positive hydrogen ends of the water are attracted to the negative chloride ions and so water also surrounds each individual chloride ion and keeps it from forming a bond to sodium. So back when we talked about ionic bonds, I said that ionic bonds weren't very strong in water. And that's because water will surround each individual ion so they can't bond to each other anymore. They're too busy interacting with the water. So ionic bonds fall apart in water and you no longer have sodium chloride in water. You have sodium and chloride. We say that salts like this, that ionic molecules dissolve and dissociate. They separate into their separate ions in water. Salts like this are referred to as electrolytes when they dissolve in water because now we have these electrically charged particles, the negative chloride and the positive sodium, and these charged particles are floating around in the water. And these electrical charges are why we call them electrolytes. So sodium, chloride, potassium, these are all called electrolytes because they float around as charged ions in the water. Polar covalent molecules will also dissolve in water. So if you have a molecule that's got a lot of polar bonds in it, say a lot of hydrogens and oxygens, it will also dissolve in water, but it does not fall apart into its separate atoms. Covalent bonds are strong enough that covalent bonds will typically stay together in water. And water will be attracted to the different positive and negative parts of the polar molecule and surround each individual molecule. And that's how sugar dissolves in water. Sugar dissolves in water because the positive and negative ends of the water molecules are attracted to the positive and negative parts of the sugar molecule and they surround each individual sugar molecule dissolving it into the water. Nonpolar covalent molecules are a different situation. Nonpolar covalent molecules do not dissolve well in water at all. Something like um, oil, which is really just a whole lot of carbon and hydrogen strung together. Remember, carbon and hydrogen are about the same. They make a nonpolar bond. There are no positive or negative areas in a nonpolar molecule. And if you don't have any positive or negative areas, the water is not attracted to that nonpolar molecule. Instead, the water molecules are more attracted to each other, and they will actually separate from the nonpolar molecules. So nonpolar molecules tend to separate from water and do not dissolve into it, like oil.